dissatisfaction, and he's relentless in his attacks. He never tires of trying to bring us down. Friends, listen to me, nobody's perfect. No home is perfect. No family is perfect. No church is perfect. There's always problems in any relationship. When I was a, when I was a boy, I had a, a horse. I was just a little guy when I got the horse. And uh, when I saw him out in the past, he was just looked, he was six months old when I, uh, or I don't even believe he was that old. He wasn't even six months old. He was younger than that. I saw a little colt out there, and, uh, and I got him for my own. And uh, brought him and put him in the pasture, and I was probably about 11, something like that. And uh, I started caring for him, and I'd brush him and comb him, and I would uh, clean out his hooves, and I'd feed him and work on his stable, clean out his stall, and all those other things you had to do for a horse. All the commands. And I grew up with him. We were buddies. I mean, we really were. I mean, I could walk down to the pasture, and he'd come running to see him. Running. I mean, I, it was amazing uh, what a relationship I had with him. In fact, it, it was really amazing because I, when I went off to college, I had to sell him. I couldn't care for him anymore. That was why I cried that day. And uh, but some of the men my dad worked with who had plenty of acres and plenty of horses. It was something like, uh, something like 15 years that I had not seen him. And one day, uh, I was telling my dad, 17 years later, I, my dad was telling me about it. I said, is he still living? Is he? Dad said, yeah. I said, I sure wish I could see him. Dad said, why don't you, why don't you come with me? We'll ride over and see him. And I remember walking down there in that pasture. And I hadn't seen him in 17 years. He'd been with all, all those other horses and all. And anyway, so I walked in that pasture, and, and uh, I just saw some horses out in the woods, kind of down in the lower pasture, and then had hundreds of acres. And I walked down to I find up in a deer stand and was calling his name and my dad was walking down in the pasture. I, I got down and started walking. I saw some horses. So I walked in the lower pasture. I'm down there. And uh Comanche. Uh, I saw him walk, kind of walk through the horses, you know. He kind of was kind of walking toward me. And when he saw me, he ran. And I grabbed his head and started rubbing his ears and he was nuzzling on me, you know, and and I, you know, we were up in that pasture. My dad said, I just can't believe it. Look at that. And I grabbed a hold of his mane and I slung my leg up on there bareback. I kicked him. I said, Let's go, boy. And across the pasture we went in those saddle ground. This took off. What a relationship we had. And when he was growing up, he'd be in his pasture. And he had I made sure he had green grass that day. He had beautiful grass. And uh, had barbed wire fence around the around the pasture. And I uh, remember watching him. He'd go in there as good as that pasture grass was, as good as sweet feed. I'd give him sweet feed too. And as good as that was, you know what that rascal would do? He'd stick his head through the barbed wire, his old long neck, and try to eat that. Ground he grass on the outside of that pasture. Yeah, that old scraggly grass out there. He'd stick his head through there and try to eat that old brown, brown grass when he had all that beautiful lush green grass all around him. Why on earth he would do that? You know there's a moral there, isn't it? The grass is not always green. The Lord puts you in family, puts you in churches for a purpose. And He expects you to work together for that purpose. And that purpose must measure up to the purpose that Jesus has to reconcile people to God. And let me tell you what I've observed in my ministry. That if the group of people, class, or small group, or ministry group, that group loses its focus and becomes so focused on its own self that it becomes a place of dissension and disunity, God breaks it apart. See, he, he removes ministries. 
whole ministries. He removes people who do not measure up to what He has for them. The purpose of God is to bring people together around Him. And if you or I are not going to do that, then God is going to let you go. And stick your neck through the barbed wire and scratch yourself up trying to get something that He hasn't planted for you. See? That's what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2, 21. It's in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. That's you and I. You and I are planted in Christ so that we can be a holy temple in the Lord. And if there's something that's not holy there, then God's going to deal with that. Now, as long as our eyes are upon Him, we will have a unifying purpose that transcends differences. We'll have a common goal. But when we take our focus off of Jesus and we put that focus on ourselves, and we all, then we allow Satan to disrupt and bring friction and tension and suspicion and dissatisfaction. We should always remember something. First, that Christ's purpose is to unify the church in Himself. That's what Paul said in verse 8 through 10. Therefore, he says, when He ascended on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, He ascended, what does it mean but that He also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that He might fill all things. Now, this is an interesting passage of Scripture and one that's very difficult to understand unless you look at it in its proper context, but I'm going to help you understand it. You remember that the context, context of Ephesians in this passage of Scripture is to bring people together in Christ. Hasn't, hasn't he been saying that the whole time? That God is at work in Christ bringing people together. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, was His Spirit alive or dead? What was it? When He died on the cross, His body died, was His Spirit alive or His Spirit dead? He was alive. He was very much alive. Don't you believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? That your Spirit lives after your body dies? Of course. Jesus was alive. Now, Nick, Joseph and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus down from the cross and laid it in the tomb. But Jesus was still at work. Verses 8 and 9 tells us that Jesus descended and then ascended with a captive audience. Well, where did He descend? He descended to the lower parts of the earth. Now, in Hebrew thought, the lower parts of the earth was a place called in Hebrew Sheol, which was the resting place for the dead. Sheol was the grave. It was the resting place of the dead. Now, there were two parts to Sheol. A place of punishment called a Gehenna or hell. And a place of rest called Abraham's bosom or paradise. Now, Jesus talked about this place in Luke chapter 16. So I want you to leave your finger there just a minute. I want you to go to Luke 16 and you'll really do some Bible investigation and you'll really be excited about what, what God has to say to you. So go back to Luke 16. I'm going to show you something. In Luke 16, Jesus told a story of two men who died. And one was rich in this life. And when he died, he opened his eyes and he and he was tormented in flames. And the other was a beggar named Lazarus. And then he was a beggar in this life. But when he, lived, when he died and opened his spiritual eyes in paradise, he saw Father Abraham. Now, look with me at this story. Look at verses 19 through 22. There was a certain rich of Luke 16. Now there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and also, also died and was buried. So what do we know first? We know that both men died. So we're talking about a place where the dead go. 
Now in verse 22, the angels carry Lazarus to Abraham's bosom or the place where he could be comforted by his faith father, Abraham. But the rich man was buried, and immediately he found himself in hell, or the Greek word of Hades. So look at verse, look at verse 23. And being in torments, the rich man, being in torments in hell, or Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham fall and Lazarus in his bosom. The rich man in the side, the side of Sheol where he was tormented could see, could see Abraham and Lazarus. He was far off, but he was close enough to get Abraham's attention. Look verse 24 through 26. So the rich man cried out and said, Father Abraham, he cried loudly, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between you and, I, you and us, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Why anybody would want to pass from, from, uh, from us to you, we do not know. But Abraham is making the statement and saying there is two compartments and there's a place of torment for the wicked, a place of comfort for the just, and you cannot cross that barrier and, the and those who are just are like this, this beggar and like Abraham. And who are they? They are the Old Testament people of faith. Now, look at verses 27 through 31. Then the rich man said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The dead. See verse 29? Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. What's missing? What's missing is Jesus. Jesus is missing. See, they did not have Messiah Jesus because he had not yet died on the cross. They only had their Old Testament faith in the coming Messiah. And that was not enough to get them to, par to paradise. That was enough. Their Old Testament faith was enough to get them to paradise in the presence of Abraham, but it was not enough to get them into the presence of a holy God in heaven. So Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, He became the door into heaven and eternal life. So Jesus had a lot to do in those two nights after the crucifixion. He had to prepare a place in heaven, and then He had to go get those Old Testament saints who were in paradise or Abraham's bosom. Hey, remember on the cross when Jesus was dying and he had these thieves beside of him. And one thief asked him, said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He prayed a prayer of faith. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in where? Paradise. Today. That was the day Jesus died. Today. You will be with me in paradise. 
See, today was Friday. The day, the day Jesus would die. Jesus said, today when I die, I'm going to paradise. And Paul told us why he went to paradise. Verse 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended, Ephesians 4, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And now this he ascended, what does it mean? But also he first descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might feel all things. The purpose for which Jesus went to paradise was so he could bring the Old Testament saints into the New Testament. And they did one body, just like he did with the Jews and the Gentiles on the earth. And in verse 10, why? So that he might feel all things. The Greek word Paul used for feel is that word pleuro, and that word literally means to make complete in every particular, to render perfect, to carry through to the end, to accomplish. The reason that Jesus went to paradise was to complete the Old Testament faith of those people. The church could not be complete without those Old Testament saints. What if they were still there, folks? Listen. What if Jesus had died on the cross, just went and ascended on into heaven, left those Old Testament saints down in paradise? You know what would have happened? You and I would have died and we'd have gone to heaven. And who would not be there? Moses, Daniel, David, Jeremiah, Abraham. They wouldn't be there if Jesus had not suffered and bled and died to redeem all people of faith of all generations. Each person, every person who has ever expressed faith in the Savior of the world is made part of the church. And friends, now the church is still not complete. There's a church on earth. There's a church in heaven. And our hearts are grieved because people that you have loved and I have loved have left us have gone to heaven. And we are still here. But one day, that's going to all change. One day the Lord Jesus is coming again. Paul said with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain should be called up instantly, transformed and called up to meet the Lord in the clouds. But the church will still not be complete. For seven years of great tribulation will go on on the earth. And during that time, people will be turning to faith in Christ. Some will. Then after that great tribulation, the world will look up. And they will see the King of kings and Lord of lords coming in glory, in the clouds of great glory. And every eye will see. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And then He will come again and He will complete us. And then as Paul said in verse 10, He will feel, He will perfectly complete all things. Now that's why we must keep telling people about Jesus' church. That's, we must have Jesus as the priority in our lives, in our families, in our church. What would have happened if someone like Lottie had not told her family. Told, what would have happened family if someone like Lottie hadn't told you? What would have happened to you if someone hadn't told you about Jesus? Time is too short and the mission too important to focus on things that will not matter for eternity. And let's face it folks, most of our teaching goes toward things that will not matter for eternity. It just won't make an eternal difference. Give them to Jesus. What God has called you to do, He will always give you the grace to do it. That's what Paul said in verse 7. That each one of us grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. That's similar to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Whatever you face, you will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Jesus promised all the things you need to be at. In a recent sermon called, Would a Loving God Send People to Hell? John Portberg, again with this illustration, said, there's a book that came out several years ago that gives you instructions on what to do in the direst circumstances that 
you can that you can imagine. It's called the Worst Case Scenario Survivor's Handbook. Now, the Worst Case Scenario Survivor's Handbook has sold millions of copies and covers every kind of situation you can imagine. In this book, it covers how to perform an emergency tracheotomy. What to do if you run into a mountain lion. How to respond if you jump out of a plane and your parachute doesn't open. Now, it is written straight. It actually is advice from experts in their field. The best advice on what to do in these situations. But nobody buys the book for actual advice. It, it's sold in humor sections of the bookstores as a kind of joke. Well, John Ortberg said, I was reading this handbook a, couple, a, a few weeks ago. When I turned to a page, it came to a section that was called How to Survive a Tsunami. And the things that happened about what happened in Japan. He said, all of, sudden, all of a sudden, it wasn't fun anymore. It was so strange. I sat there reading, and all I could think of was how a few months, how a couple years ago or a year ago, or so so many lives might have been spared. How many hundreds of thousands of hearts might not be broken now if people had just known the information in this book? It was meant to be humorous, but and it is until that scenario actually happens. It's not fun. Friends, right now, the world, like we have described, is laughing at us and God. But one day it's not going to be fun, is it? And that's why you and I have to give them the information in this book. Amen? Give them the information that they need lots. That's what God has called every one of us to do. Let's stand. Our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. He asked me this question. Do you have a personal relationship? If you don't, today's the day. In fact, it might be your last opportunity. Call upon Jesus to find the eternal life. This could be it. I can help you. I've got the information. I've told it to you. Jesus died for you on the cross. He shed his blood because somebody has to pay for your sins. If you don't trust Jesus, you will, just like the rich man did in poor men. If you'll believe in Jesus, if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, the Bible says, whosoever will believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Would you like to do that? Why don't you pray with me right now where you are and say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry I have left you out of my life. I ask you to please forgive me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. Pay for my sins. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and forgive me. Forgive me for every sin. And be my Savior ever. Right now, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Pray that prayer. This is the most important day of your life. You need to write the date down somewhere. August the 21st, 2011 is the day you became a child of God. There's some books on the Welcome Center called Beginning Steps. Take one home. It'll help you work through, learn what it is to grow as a Christian. What it is to be a Christian. What to do next. Maybe you're here today and God's dealt with your heart in some way. Maybe you need to step your foot out and say, I'll do this for the Lord. He's calling me, I'll do this. I'll quit complaining, I'll quit making excuses, I'll do what God wants me to do. 
Maybe the Lord wants you just to refocus on Him. Quit looking at yourself or others and look at what He wants for you. Just follow Him with all your heart. Love Him with all your heart. Maybe you need to be a part of this church and God's brought you here to join you. We'd like to have Our arms are open wide. We want you part of our family. I can help you with that. I'll be here at the front while we're singing. If you need help. Father, I pray that whatever decisions need to be made, Father, you know what we need every one of us. In Jesus' name. Let's go,